pride, strength, mentor, support, power, dad, father, family, finisher, servant, blessed. What makes a good man? What makes a godly man? My name is Leroy Campbell. I'm one of the pastors here, if you're new here. Um, and I've had the opportunity to teach the last couple of weeks on what it means uh, to be a godly man. And let me just say this. Um, I'm really going to miss that bumper. <laughs> I know I've mentioned it every single week, but it's so soothing. I, I tell you what, guys, if the weather gets bad today and you start getting a little anxiety, just pull that bumper video up and watch it again. It just makes you feel safe, makes you feel calm, doesn't it? All right. Um, no, I'm just having a little fun, but the, here's the thing. Like, I, I hope that all of you have been encouraged by this series. The idea behind it was to be an encouragement, and, and, and if you've missed the, the last three weeks, I hope that you'll just take the opportunity to go back and listen to the podcast or, or catch up online. Um, I, I really believe in what we've been talking about, and, and I've been preaching, I promise you, I've been preaching to myself as much as I've been preaching to you guys. And, and I think the things that we've been talking about can really make a difference. You see, what we've been addressing over the last couple of weeks is, is the role of the Christian man, the role of a godly man, what it looks like to be a leader in the church and the home. And what we've said over and over again throughout this series that, is that to be a godly man is to lead. And, and our primary role or our primary responsibility as leaders is to help bring out God's best in others. I think we've made that abundantly clear over the last couple of weeks. And so here's the thing. I, I, I was thinking about that. And I was like, I know that's what we all want in a leader, right? I know that's what I want in a leader. I want someone who's going to bring the best out of me, whether it be, um, whether it be like a, a, a leader of my country, a leader, leader of an organization that I'm a part of, a leader of uh, where I work, or a, a leader of a team or a sport, or I don't know. I just, I just want a leader who's going who's gonna to bring the best. If I'm going to call you my leader, I'm, I'm going to look to you as my leader. I want you to be invested in me. <laughs> I, wanna, I want you to, to, to bring the best out of me. And, and for me, and I'm sure for a lot of you guys, the, the number one way that, that I've experienced that in my life is through sports. I, I played sports um, from the time that I was... Four, year old, four years old to the time I, I played organized sports from the time I was four till I was about 20. And, man, some of the coaches I've had over the years, they have had some of the greatest impact on my life. It is amazing the difference uh, a, a leader, a coach especially, who is very intentional about investing in you and bringing you the best. It's, it's a crazy the impact that they can have on your life. You know, still to this day, I can bump into a little league coach or a, a junior high or high school coach at the grocery store at Walmart, and I, I get those feelings of admiration, you know? Like, uh, it, it doesn't matter how much time has passed. He's still my coach. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You bump into that coach at Walmart, and he may have coached you when you were seven, uh, but in your mind, he's still coach. I mean, if he told you to give him a lap around Walmart, you might do it, right? Like, because he's coach. That's coach. Like, I, it's just something about when, when someone is intentional and, and they invest in you, they, they leave a mark. And I can tell you that, that these men have, have made a permanent imprint on my life. They, they have been difference makers for me. And, and, I, and I learned so much about leadership um, and, and how to be a good leader and even how to be a bad leader through sports. You see, I, looking at me, I know you couldn't tell, but I, I wasn't always the best athlete, you know. Like, shocking, right? <laughs> like, I, I wasn't the fastest. Who knew, right? <laughs> like, um, I wasn't the most coordinated. Um, I know, I, again, I know you're shocked, but it's true. I, I just wasn't, I wasn't the greatest athlete. Um, but 
I was very eager to please. I was very eager to please. And um, because I wasn't the greatest athlete and I was eager to please, I had to work really, really hard to be noticed. I, I, I really, I, I mean, I wanted to be one of the guys. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be noticed. And, and so I worked really, really hard to be noticed. And, and what that got me, this eagerness to please and this, this hard work ethic, what ended up happening is just about every league I ever played in, I ended up being a team captain. You know, I, I would get in my coach's eye because he just liked, you know, it's like the most improved player. You know, I'd just catch their eye because I, because I worked really hard and I was a good example. And the thing about being a team captain is you, you didn't have to say much, right? Like, um, all the way through sports in high school as a team captain, I, didn't, I wasn't the guy that yelled and got in other people's faces. I wasn't the guy that was like the rah-rah, let me get everybody pumped up guy. No, I just, I just, I was just passionate about what I was doing. I, I worked hard, I played hard, I competed hard, and I competed with a lot of passion, and, and I was a good example. But <clears throat> here's the thing, um, I, I, as a team captain, I, I didn't have to use my words very often. And as a matter of fact, I know there was other team captains, but I don't, I don't remember them. <laughs> I, don't rem- remember, I don't remember who they were, and I'm sure they probably don't remember that I was a team captain. But, but we all remember our coaches. And here's the question I have for you. Why do we all remember the coach, but we can't remember the team captain? Both were leading. Both were responsible um, for making the team better. Both played a role, but it's the coach that we remember. Why is that? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. The reason for that is, is words. It's words. See, uh, as the coach, all you have is words. Team captain, he can go out and he can make a big play and he can get everybody fired up, right? He can run out onto the field and do something and, and, and lead by example. But as a coach, you can't do that. As a coach, all you have is, is your words and you can use your words to motivate you can use your words to inspire. You can use your words to correct. You can use your words to affirm or to encourage. Um, you, you, words for a coach are very powerful. And at the same time, um, your words can work against you as a coach. Your words can discourage, right? Your words can hinder. They can demoralize, right? They can, um, they can hamstring. They can undermine. Like, and so as, as a coach, the best coaches know you got to be careful with your words, your words are all you got. Either, either you're going you're gonna to help, you're going to bring out the best in somebody with your words, or you're going to hurt them. And so that's why coaches are, are known, and so many of them are so brilliant with words, because it's what they do every day. They, they are trying to get the most out of their athletes, the most out of the kids that they're coaching, and they have to use the words. One of the greatest ever at doing this, to me, probably the greatest coach of all time in any sport, was John Wooden. He was the coach of, uh, the UC, of UCLA, UCLA men's basketball for 12 years. Ten of those 12 years, he won a national championship. He won seven in a row, which is a NCAA record in both men's and women's basketball still to this day. It's never been done by anyone else. He, he was an incredible leader, and he knew how to use words to inspire. If you go online and you look up John Wooden and you look up quotes from John Wooden, you're going to get an in, it's, the, the searches can go on forever. There's list after list of incredible things that he said. And so just to kind of get us started with what we're going to be talking about today, because <clears throat> if you haven't guessed, I'm going to be talking about the power of words. I'm going to be talking about um, not only how we lead, but some of the mistakes that we make once we step into that role of leader. I want to look at this uh, John Wooden, and I just want to have a little fun. Let's, let's listen to some of the things. Tell me if you are familiar with some of the things that he is, he is known for saying. This is one of his famous quotes here. It says, Be more concerned with your character than your reputation, reputation because your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think of you. Man, isn't that good? <laughs> How about this one? If you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it over? Man, my dad, my dad really liked that one, right? (laughs) How about this one? Nothing will work unless you do. That's so good. How about this one? Things turn out best for people who make the best out of the way things turn out. Man, so good. This last one is probably my favorite. It's not what you learn after you know, it's, I'm sorry, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. What you learn after you know it all that counts. Aren't those so good? 
Aren't those incredible? I mean, I, I, again, it, you, you have no idea how difficult it was to choose just five. You know, because this was a man who used his words to make a difference. This was a man who used his words to bring the best out of people. And, and coaches are known for that. As a matter of fact, coaches are some of the most quoted men in history because they understood something. And what they understood is that words have power. Let me say that again. Words have power. <clears throat> um, we teach our kids sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? Like, who, who's heard that before? Everybody in the room, right? Who said that before? Probably everybody in the room. But what we all know is we're a bunch of liars, right? <laughs> we're liars. That's, that's a lie that we tell kids because we know the power of words. So it's like, hey, just so you don't get hurt by all the mean things that kids say to each other, let me just make up this little rhyme and it'll help you. No, we know that's not true. As a matter of fact, most of us in this room would probably trade a few broken bones for the harsh things that have been said to us in our lives. It's like, yeah, <laughs> break it. If I have no memory of that, please break it, you know, take it away. Because for many of us, our deepest wounds have come from words, right? Some of the th things that just have stuck with us over the years have come from words. People have used words to shape our lives, either for good or for bad. And here's the thing, <laughs> us guys, sometimes we don't know the difference. I mean, and what I mean is we don't know the difference between good words and bad words. And let, let me explain. I have two older brothers. I, that's probably explanation enough, right? I have two older brothers, and I have three male siblings who are like brothers who grew up with me right next door. One of them's in the room. Oh, two of them, actually. Um, we, we were like brothers growing up. There were six boys, Okay. Let me just tell you, we didn't understand the power of words growing up. Actually, we did. We knew they could do a lot of damage, and we were quite proficient with them, right? Like, you can only imagine the torment that we put one another through. It, we, we never let up. You, you put six guys together for that long a time, it, just, it, it is over. Going to the bus stop... Man, and getting and and hoping that you could just get on the bus so there's other people to pick on. Man, that was a reality. <laughs> okay, you walk down to the bus stop with a new haircut, it's coming. You walk down to the bus stop with a shirt that's a little loud, it's coming. You pick up a ball and it slips, and you throw it a little sissy fied, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. You say something dumb, you will never hear the end of it. We were relentless, and it didn't stop with just family. Me and my buddies, all the way through high school, we were cruel to one another. <laughs> we were cruel. Let me just say it. We were cruel. See, you, got, you ladies, y'all do it behind each other's back. But us, us guys, <laughs> us guys, we, <laughs> we don't understand that because it's no fun if you can't see their face when you insult them. Like, like the, that's the fun part, right? It's crazy. I, I'm telling you. And, and, and for some reason, we just kind of embrace it. I, I saw a guy the other day at Costco. Um, I played football with him. When I was a ninth grader, I played on the varsity, and, and he was a senior, and he wasn't very good, okay? Actually, he was really bad. Um, but he had played four years of football, and I don't know that he ever saw the field. He was really small. Um, he had really thick glasses. I mean, you picture the guy in the movie who, who never gets into the game, okay? Like, he had, he had thick glasses, and he was really tiny. Um, and he had a lot of passion, though. And, and when he talked, he blinked a lot. And it earned him the nickname Blinky. Everybody called him Blinky. I, and so I, I'm walking through Costco the, the other day, and I see this guy. And he and I were friends because I was a ninth grader, and I didn't get to play a lot either, right? And so we were buddies. And, 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 and I couldn't remember his real name. All I could remember is, hey, there goes Blinky, <laughs> you know? That this insult had literally become his identity. And the crazy thing about it is he seemed to embrace it. He loved being a part of the team. Yes, he was ridiculed. Yes, he was picked on. It was brutal. But he knew the guys loved him, and he embraced it. And honestly, as a ninth grader on the varsity, it was awful. It was rough. But I wouldn't have changed it for anything because I was part of the guys. I was one of the boys, right? Like I, I was in. If, if you weren't getting picked on, something was wrong, right? It's kind of a rite of passage for men. 
As a matter of fact, it, this is what I know. And, and, and again, don't think that I'm condoning this. It's just true, okay? I'm a pastor. We have two other pastors at this church. Guys, if I say something dumb up here today, or if I leave my mic on during worship, you better believe when I open my email tomorrow, there is going to be an edited remix version of whatever I said <laughs> from Pastor Tripp and Pastor Scott just to have a little fun at my expense. That's who we are as men. Now, I don't mean to condone it. I, I, I'm not saying that this is good. As a matter of fact, I know that people have been really hurt because of it. And, and, and I know, I know, and I believe, in it, and part of what I'm going to talk about today is that there is a better way. But the reason I said all that is because I, I, I want to recognize the fact that men have been conditioned in their life to, to believe that words don't matter. They've been conditioned throughout their lives to believe that they can be careless with their words. And, and here's the thing that you need to know today. If we want to be godly men, we have to recondition ourselves to understand that our words do matter. Hear me, guys. If we want to be godly men, we have to recondition ourselves. It's a, lot of been, a lot of garbage has been put in, but guys, we have to recondition ourselves to know that our words matter matter that we cannot continue to be careless with our words <clears throat> um with with that I, i'm gonna we're gonna go ahead and, and jump into a little bit of scripture here but i, I want to warn you guys that today is gonna look a little different because um i'm not gonna i'm not i, I i'm gonna throw a little bit of scripture at you but we're honestly not gonna we're not gonna stay in scripture very long because i think this i think we already know this right don't we already know that words matter? I mean, Scripture could not be more clear that words matter. Uh, I, I mean, the Bible itself is proof that, God, that words matter, right? Like, uh, our entire faith is built on the carefully recorded words of men who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, right? Like, that alone should be enough for us to realize that words matter matter. Uh, if that wasn't enough, the Bible itself is filled with power. Try reading it consistently on a regular basis and see if it doesn't have power to make a difference in your life. The, the, God's Word in and of itself has power. The first book of the Bible says that God spoke everything that we know, the universe, into existence, meaning He used words to create us and everything else. He, used, he literally spoke and use words to give us life. He spoke and used words to reveal himself to us. He spoke, he speaks and uses words to mold us and change us and guides us. God knew the power of words. And he never wanted us to forget the power of words. And in and, and John chapter 1, verse 1, it says this: In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Again, more proof that words are important. John is actually talking about Jesus here. And what he's saying is that Jesus is the living, breathing Word of God. Words matter. Words are so important. But somehow, somehow we still forget. God knew, he knew that was going to be the case. Guess what? He wasn't surprised. And so Scripture is filled to the brim with teaching on how we're to use our words how we are supposed to talk to one another, how we should be careful, how we should use wisdom. It's over and over and over again. Um, James said that the tongue is like a spark that can set off a, a, a wildfire. He said the tongue is like a rotor, a tiny little rotor on a ship that can turn an entire ship. James warns us that, that the tongue has power. And not just him, the Apostle Paul said it. He said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only what is good for building one another up. It has power. The book of Proverbs, what we call the book of wisdom, there, literally, like the John Wooden thing, there were a million verses I could have pulled out to teach us what it, how powerful our words are and how we need to be careful with our words. And I did. I decided to pull out a few. Here's, here's one of those. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. How about this one? Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And here's my favorite. The tongue has the power of life and death. This one to me, this one speaks to me. 
This one right here really gets to what it is that I wanted to communicate today. What if we took that seriously? What if we really believe that the tongue had the power of life and death? Because that's what he's getting at here. He's saying every word that comes out of your mouth is either life or it's death. Think about that for a moment. Think about how huge that is. To, to really, if you really believe that every word of, that comes out of your mouth is life or death, that's the idea here. I believe this is true. I believe e every word that comes out of our mouth is either advancing God's kingdom and advancing life, or it's inviting darkness. It's inviting death. Words are powerful. Guys, we, we know this about words. We know the effect that words have on people. We know the, the wounds and the things that we're carrying around with because of words. We know that we have been marked by words. This is not new information at all. There's nothing about this that is new to any of us. As leaders, here's the thing, though. As leaders, we cannot afford to be careless with our words. As a matter of fact, as a, it is a matter of life and death. Men... I know you've been conditioned to think that words don't matter. They matter. They are a matter of life and death. Thinking about that, meditating on that, chewing on that, would it change the way that you speak? Would you be as careless with your words if you really believed they were a matter of life and death? I think that is the approach that we need to take to become and be who we have been called to be, to lead the way that we have been called to lead. Too many times, we as Christians, we as men, we as godly men, we as women, we have allowed our words to speak death into people. To speak death into people. We have missed opportunities to speak life. Levi Lesko said this in a, in a sermon I listened to recently, and I thought it was really good. He says, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, then he should be the Lord of your lips too. Amen, right? Like, Amen. A lot of, there's a lot of people that need to hear that, right? I, I, I'm sorry. It breaks my heart when I get on social media and I see Christians just being so careless with their words towards one another even, tearing one another down. It's just, it is, it is jacked up the way that we, the way that we are just so careless. And knowing how, how big a deal this is, knowing what Scripture says about words, knowing, despite knowing that we ourselves have been wounded deeply by words maybe it was something your father said or something your mother said or maybe it was something your children said maybe it was a teacher or a mentor or a coach maybe it was a brother or a friend we know the impact that words can have on our life we know that wars have been literally started over words that people have been turned against each other because of words genocide has taken place because of words and despite all of that we continue to be careless we continue to be careless. People walk away from the church, not because they don't love Jesus, but because we Christians aren't careful with our words. People miss the opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus just because we're not careful, because we're careless with our words. And so, bottom line here, <laughs> stop being so careless with your words. They have power. They have power. It matters. Guys, there's a million different directions I could have gone with today's message on being a godly man. But I chose this because I believe that this is super important. I, I also chose this is because this is an area of weakness in my life. This, 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 what I'm talking about today, is an area where I struggle. See, I've, I've always been a talker. I came from a family of debaters. You know, we were lawyers in my house, right? Like, we love to argue. Um, we love to have our opinions heard. We love to put our two cents in, and we didn't mind stepping on each other's toes a little bit. Now, me, I was always a nice guy. I never intentionally wanted to hurt anybody's feelings. I, as a matter of fact, I, I didn't like, I don't like people, oh, well, and I, I already said I, I, I hurt the guy's feelings, but y'all know that's different, right? Um, <clears throat> but but I, I never really, you know, wanted anybody to be upset with me. I, I was a nice guy even before I was a Christian. Um, but I have opinions. I have thoughts. I think about things. I, I think having opinions as a leader is important because it's how we problem solve, right? Like, you know, you have ideas, you have opinions, and it's kind of how we solve problems. As men, solving problems is in our DNA, isn't it? Solving problems is kind of what makes us 
us, right? Because as men, as leaders, we see problems. I see all the problems. I see not just my problems. I see everybody's problems. It's amazing, right? In my home, I, I see I see the pro- problems with how we raise our kids. I see problems with how uh, we handle our finances. I see problems with how we take care of our home. I see problems with how we handle our schedule. I see all the problems. And as a man, there's something in me that wants to fix all the problems. That wants to use my, my thoughts and my ideas and my opinions to try to make things better. But this is, an, this is the point, and, and I want to stop here for a second. This is the point where we find out what kind of leader we really are, isn't it? This is the point where I believe many leaders make mistakes. This is the point where I think many of us, as we step into the role of leadership, we've got to be so very careful. And the reason I know that is because I've made a ton of mistakes in this area. And so over the next little while, the next 10 minutes or so, I want to share with you guys from my own personal story. And I want to tell you some of the mistakes that I've made and I want to share with you how the Holy Spirit has been working on me and teaching me and growing me, grow me. And I want to share with you some lessons. I want to do that for two reasons. One, um, because I want to practice what I preached about last week. I want to confess to you guys. I, I want to use my weaknesses to make a difference, hopefully for you guys. Number two is I want you guys to know that your testimony is powerful. Uh, you, you do not have to be an expert in the Bible to make a difference in people's lives. We're not going to look at another piece of Scripture the rest, the rest of the way. Well, I'm literally going to share you lessons that God has taught me through experience. Every man in here has the ability to do that. And if you can learn how to do it well, you can be a godly leader. You can make a difference for people. And so that's what I want to do. So I'm just going to begin. A, a year and a half ago or so, we were, we were going through our first round with the J-men. I talked about those in the, in the first message. Just... Just a group of guys who are, who are working on becoming a better leader, leaders together over a year-long process. And uh, we were probably a little over halfway, and, and we've been learning a lot, and I've been growing a lot. And, and part of J-Men is you're constantly evaluating. You're constantly evaluating you yourself as a leader, um, as a godly man. And, and um, you're evaluating your relationships and, and how you do in every part of your life. And I can tell you, at that time, I felt like I was doing pretty good in most areas of my life, except for one. And that one area was my marriage. When it came to how I was leading in my marriage, I gave myself an F. And it bothered me. <laughs> See, my wife, uh, she, I, I, I was learning, I was growing, and I wanted to, to, to speak into her, but she just seemed so defensive. Every time I tried to help, every time I tried to bring something up, it turned into a fight, and I didn't, I didn't understand what I was doing wrong, and it was breaking me. I, I, literally, we, we were having so many arguments at the time. Things, we, weren't, we weren't nowhere near divorce or anything like that, but, but things were bad. Things weren't very good, and I, I had no idea how to lead her. I had no idea what I was doing wrong, and so in humility, I came to her, and I said, and it was after a fight, and I was emotional, and I was feeling like a, a failure, and I said, what am I doing wrong? I felt defeated. I said, help me understand what it is that I'm doing wrong. And through tears, she told me, through te- and she, she said it was okay that I shared all this today, by the way. Through tears, she told me that she knew she, that I loved her, but that I make her feel terrible about who she is. Through tears, she told me I made her feel like a failure as a mom and as a wife. And guys, let me just tell you, I had no idea. I was completely, I was like, what do, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And she was like, your, 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 your critiques, your criticism, your constant playing around and joking around and messing around, it hurts me. See, my, my fun and my cr- criticism and my critiques and my problem solving, along with her own insecurities has created some deep wounds in her. What I didn't realize is that for the first eight years of our marriage, I had been speaking words of death into my wife, and it was finally showing up. And it was bad. And she was hurt. It got to the point where I couldn't say anything. When I would speak, whether I was not being critical or it really was a joke, all she heard is that she was a failure. And I'm like, I didn't... I get, so, I get so frustrated. I'm like, what are you talking about? 
it was it, it was so it was it was eye opening. And here's the thing: I I never once told her she was not a good wife. I never once told her that she was a failure. I never even thought those things. As a matter of fact, I believed the exact opposite. At the time, I thought my wife was superwoman, guys. I thought she was amazing. I thought she was an amazing wife and an awesome mom. She worked full time and took care of our responsibilities at home like she didn't have a job, right? She was literally superwoman. She worked so that I could pursue my dreams of being a pastor and starting a brand new church and not earning a salary. She, she, I, I was amazed by her ability to juggle things. I could not believe that she didn't know that. And that's where I learned my first lesson, and it's this. There's no power in assuming good things. There's only, it's only in speaking them. There's no power in assuming good things, only in speaking them. See, I didn't tell her all those things. I didn't tell her that I thought she was super mom. I didn't tell her how awesome she was. I, I assumed that she knew it, but I never spoke those things into her. We have to begin speaking those things. When, when you think good things, we got to say them. If you're, if you're going to be a leader, this is what you got to do. You, you got to tell people how valuable they are to you. You got to tell people how much they mean to you. You got to tell people how much they worth. You got to compliment them. You got to brag on them. You have to thank them. Men, we're the worst about this. We assume it, we think it, but we never say it. And the, the, there's power in the words. As leaders, every time we assume something good without speaking it, we miss an opportunity to speak life into those we're leading. And I had missed opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to speak life into my wife. And instead, all, all she was hearing was the negative. Guys, we have to get this right. Our, our, our greatest resource... Our words are our greatest resource we, ha we have when it comes to investing in people. They don't cost us anything, and we have an infinite supply. I don't know where I heard that. I can't remember who said it, but it stuck with me. We have an infinite supply. It is our greatest resource. Most people speak about 5,000 words a day. Leaders, men, it's time to make those words count. It's time to make those words matter, to, to make a difference. We are missing opportunities every day to speak life. Just like they have power for, for the bad and for darkness, they have power for life, and we have to take advantage of those opportunities. And so that night, I told Katie what I really thought. And then as far as Jay, man, I wrote a letter, and I told her what I really thought about her. And I told her how amazing she was. And I made a commitment that I was going to begin speaking those words of life to her, but that wasn't enough. I also had to work on the criticism. And for me, I thought that was going to be easy. I was like, that's, that's not a big deal at all. I, I can do that because... Honestly, the things that you're, you call criticisms, they're, they're not even that big a deal to me. They're just thoughts. They're just ideas. I, I thought I was being helpful. You know, I don't, I don't care about those things. You know, that, that'll be easy. That'll be easy for me, I thought. You know, that, that those things, they just, you know, they weren't a big deal to me. But what I didn't realize is that it was just how often that they were happening. <laughs> it was, you know, what I thought were suggestions what i thought were helpful they, they were they were destroying her confidence see here's the thing constant critiques create leaks constant critiques create leaks when you are constantly critiquing someone their confidence begins to leak out when you're constantly showing reminding someone somewhere where they need a little improvement when you're constantly coming in behind them and saying hey why don't you do this why don't you fix this why don't you change this everything that they know about themselves it begins to go away my wife she wasn't a defensive person she wasn't always like that she was a very confident woman but over time my critiques had begun to wear on her and her confidence had began to leak out and we know what this is like it's the dad at the ball field who never lets up on his son and every word the dad speaks, you can just see the confidence in the kid just going out. And you're just like, Dad, just shut up and tell me he did a good job. Right? We're all thinking just, man, he gets up to the place and he's a nervous wreck because he's trying to remember all those helpful tips from Dad. We know what this is like. It destroys our confidence. If you ever had a boss that's constantly critiquing you, you, you begin to feel like you can't do your job without them. It destroys your confidence. As leaders, we've got to get this right. We can't afford to get this wrong. With our kids, when they're little, we're careful. We're a little more careful, but as they get older, we expect more. Our expectations get higher and the critiques come in. With your teenagers, 
Are you, are you speaking life into them? Are you reminding them about all the good things that they do and reminding them and, and building their confidence? Are you constantly critiquing them? Fathers, we can't mess this up. We got to get this right. But that wasn't enough either. See, guys, I'm confessing. <laughs> I wasn't done with the stopping the critiques because there was something else. See, I'm a, I'm a jokester. <laughs> uh, you might call me an instigator. People who know me well, they know that about me, right? Like, I, I like to have fun. I like to mess around. I like to pick and poke. That, that's, just, that's just who... Maybe it's because I was, like, in the middle of six boys. I don't know. But there's something in me that that's just, that's just kind of been a, always been a part of who I am. And, and I've always been playful and a jokester and messed around with Katie. And, and it was just a part of our relationship. But somewhere along the way, it stopped being fun for her. She didn't like it very much. She, now, she didn't, and I think she tried to tell me that she didn't like it very much, but I didn't hear it. But see, if you, you know, the thing about me being this, you know, this, this guy that's nice and has good intentions, who has very thick skin because I was brutally picked on myself, so, you know, I don't realize how words can hurt people as much as I should, right? Who, who likes to joke and pick, that's a disaster waiting to happen. That's a disaster waiting to happen. And, and, and if you've ever picked on somebody or made a joke on somebody and it was all in good fun, but you realize you actually hurt their feelings, you know exactly what I'm talking about. See, people like me, we have a tendency to put our foot in her mouth, right? And what we, what we realize in those moments when we put our foot in our mouth is that having fun with words comes at a cost, when you make a joke and you were meaning it in good fun and you actually hurt somebody's feelings, you feel about this big. Believe me, I've been there quite a few times. You feel about this big. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just kidding. I was just playing. But nothing you can say can take it back. You said it. It's out there. And in those moments, it's obvious that it wasn't worth it. <laughs> the joke, whatever you were doing, it, it failed and it, it wasn't worth it. And you're sitting there thinking, why am I such a fool? Why did I do that? That was so dumb. But what we don't realize is even the times when it's not so obvious, the times when everybody laughs and moves on, we're not doing good then either. See, Katie didn't just burst into tears every time I made a joke. As a matter of fact, most of the time she just laughed it off and shrugged her shoulders and, and that's all it was and it wasn't a big deal. And so I didn't realize what I was doing. But, but my constant picking and joking and playing and messing around, along with my critiques, along with her own insecurities, along with the fact that I wasn't speaking life into her on a regular basis, all of that together, it was destroying her. I was wounding her, and I didn't even realize it. And some of you guys are saying, you mean I can never joke? You mean I can never pick? You, I can't play? That's just kind of who I am. That's how I connect with people. I'm not saying you can never do it, but I'm just telling you, you better know the cost. You better know the cost, because I didn't know the cost, and I was hurting my wife. If, you, if you're that guy, if that's who you are, I want to encourage you that there is a better way. You can connect with people a better way. Try encouraging them. <laughs> try, try speaking life into them. You, it's amazing how people respond to that. Even our buddies, you might, they might make fun of you <laughs> for being nice. <laughs> You know, your buddies might start out, you start complimenting them a little bit, you start speaking life into your buddies, and they go, and they'll find a way to make a joke out of it because it makes them a little uncomfortable. But guess what? Those same guys, when they have a problem, they ain't going to go to the ones that never speak life into them. They're going to come to you. That's how it works. We need to know that our words cost something. I, guys, I'm learning this. I'm, I'm still figuring this out. I put my foot in my mouth all the time still. I, as a dad, I'm trying to figure this out because I tend to be a bit of a name caller. <laughs> Right? Knucklehead, chubba love, fat boy, you know, like slow pokes, whiny babies. Those are my favorites, okay? Like, I, I, I don't know where it comes from. It's just, I don't know what, why I do it. But this whole situation has made me a lot more aware that I better be speaking life into my kids. That better not be all they ever hear from me. And as much as I can, I need to move away from that. I need to change it. Instead of chubba love, it needs to be handsome, Right? I come in and say, hey, handsome, hey, good looking, you know, hey, princesses, hey, beautiful. I say, you're so smart, you're so good, high five. You know, and we do that when our kids are young. We know it's important, but when people get older, we forget how much those things matter. Yeah, I call my kids knucklehead still, but I've taken the time to redefine what knucklehead means. 
because that's my favorite, and I can't give it up. So, so my, my little princesses, they know knucklehead means princesses. It means that I love you more than anything of this world. We, we have had a talk. And sometimes it just takes that little bit of extra effort. But here's the thing. That was a year and a half ago. About six months ago, so a year later, after, after dealing with all this and, and, and trying to work through all this, uh, we were back to the same place with our second round of J-Men. And guys, I got to tell you, this, this, all that I'm talking about today is hard. We got to that second round of J-Men, and I looked at, back at the last year, and I thought, man, I did good for about a month. I, I, I was still giving myself an F. Things were better between Katie and I. I'd gotten a little better about speaking life into her. Um, but over, over that year, over the months following this first conversation, I realized that some of those criticisms, I didn't think I cared about them, but I actually did. I didn't think they were important to me, but they actually were. Some of those jokes, they weren't just jokes. They were, they were passive-aggressive ways for me to, to make a point. And what I realized, even though I was in a season where I knew my wife needed to be lifted up, I knew that she had been wounded, I knew that this was not the, the time, this was not the season that it was okay to be working on things. What I found is I, even a month or two months after this whole thing and, and finding out all of this, I was already being careless with my words again. And not only that, this time I was aware and I was choosing to do it. I was like, man, I know I'm not supposed to be critiquing right now, but that's really getting under my, man, she just needs to hear this one, you know? Like, she just needs to hear it. Like, I, I know it's not going to do any good. I know it's probably going to cause a fight. I know it's not going to make her feel good about herself, but I just, I just got to say it, it's worth it. How many of us have ever had that conversation? And I started having those conversations with myself, and I was going, what is this? Why is this so hard? A year has passed. I, I'm supposed to be figuring this out. And what I realized is that, I, you know, I must not care about her because I keep, because I keep, uh, I keep it up. I keep doing this. What do I need to do? How, how do I fix this? How do I solve this? And I was talking to a friend because, guys, we need each other. And, and he was having similar problems, and he said, you know, what really helped me is when I realized that I was still, the reason I was so critical with my wife was because I was still looking to be served rather than to serve. And when he said that to me, the light bulb cut on because it was like, that's exactly it. That's my problem. See, see the reason I, I had to say it, the reason I couldn't not be critical, the reason I threw out those sarcastic jokes is because I wanted my wife to serve me. I wanted her to do things my way because it was what was best for me. I wanted her to do what I wanted and do what I thought was best. And, and all the while I was thinking about myself, I wasn't thinking about serving her. I wasn't thinking about what was best for her. I was thinking about what's best for me. And that's when it hit me. To be who I've been called to be, I have to forget about me. Men, to be who you have been called to be, you got to forget about you. you got to forget about me. That it, that's the theme of this entire thing. You will continue to be critical. You will continue to be careless with your words. You will continue to joke and play even when it's not helpful until you decide that it's not about what you want or what's best for you, but it's what's best for everybody else. You will never be who you have been called to be. You can't be the godly man you have been called to be until you become a servant. See, the only way to be a godly man is to truly become a servant. I've said it four weeks in a row. <laughs> This is what it's all about. It's about putting other people's needs before your own. I like to joke. My jokes aren't helpful for my wife. Guess what? I don't need to joke. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know, I, I don't know what your struggle is. But what I want you to hear is that if it's, if it's really about bringing the best out of others, you're going to have to forget about yourself. Until you do that, you won't be able to do this. And that's been the theme throughout, and, and, and that's what I'm currently working on. This, this is a daily process for us as believers. And so to wrap this whole series up, and guys, I apologize for going long today, but I'm, I'm passionate about this, and this, this was my story. So to wrap this whole thing up today, I wanted to read something that helps me remember 
who it is that I'm called to be. This, this sits above my desk where I study, where I read God's word, where I pray for my family, where I pray for my wife. And at the top it says self-forgetfulness. And, and, and this is a passage from Philippians 2, um, 1 through 11. And I want to read this for you guys. And I, I want you to, I know when we read long passages like this, it's easy to tune things out. So I just want you to take a second. And I want you to listen and focus on the words. This is our inspiration. This is why we have been called to do what we do. This, this is why we are who we are. If you have to close your eyes, close your eyes, but listen. It says, therefore, if any, if, if you, I'm sorry. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. The glory of God, the Father. Would you pray with me? Father, you are awesome. God, I thank you that you gave us Jesus not only to be our example, not only to be our God, God, but to be our life, Lord. Father, I pray that I pray that we would live in newness of life, God. That we would be like-minded, God. That we would serve one another. That we would value one another, that we would speak life into one another, that we would encourage one another, that we would remind one another of who we are in you, God. Help us to lead the way that you led. Help us to be who we are in you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.